And now for my next number, I'd like to return to the classics. Perhaps the most famous classic in all the world of music. And that most famous classic must be the Parker 51, at least when we're talking about fountain pens, and not about classical music as Liberace was that I was lib dubbing. Um, I was asked to do a fountain pen shootout between two fountain pens, the Parker 51, uh, considered by many to be a timeless classic, uh, and the Lamy 2000. You can no longer purchase this, but you can definitely purchase that. I'll give you a brief rundown of both pens. Uh, I, I have separate reviews of these two on my channel, so if you're interested, you can just uh, check those out. Um, I'll show you how to take them apart, both of them, including the 51, and then uh, I'll do a writing sample. Starting with the 51, as I said, a classic. Uh, this is a very common pen to find on eBay or other sources. Um, a lot of people love it. It was revolutionary at the time. Um, had a nice, interesting filling system. You, you have a, a sort of vacuumatic uh, uh, 51, if I'm not mistaken. But those, this is the Aerometric, which just has a, a rubber sack with this sack protector over it. Um, has a gold nib, a fine gold nib. Um, and it's it's hooded, which is one of these uh, uh, pen's interesting features. A very well-known silhouette, I think, for many people who like fountain pens. This one has a rolled gold uh, cap, but you can also get them in alloy caps. If you, if you don't like this, you can get them in different colors. There's a Parker 51 Demi, which is a bit smaller, so there's all kinds of options if you like pens. I think this is a fairly good way to get into vintage pens because it's so widely available and usually you can find them in pretty good shape. Alright, then we have the Lamy 2000. When was that again? 1966, I think, designed by Gerd Müller. Um, sort of a Bauhaus thing, as is many stuff for Lamy. Um, this pen has been around since the 60s and it's still around, which says it's popular. Now imagine buying this in the 1960s. Uh, it must have been very futuristic uh, for that time when a lot of pens looked like this. Um, so, very interesting. You can get a metal version now. This is the Macrolon version, which has a very interesting texture. Uh, feels very interesting. It's it's smooth, and yes, it has some tech. Yet it has some texture to it. Very interesting. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to say 14 karat gold nib. Could be 18. Then I forgot, and I apologize. Um, in any way, it's a gold nib, which is most likely rhodium plated or something to give it that silver look. Um, I got an oblique nib, as you may be able to see here, it's slanted towards one side. Um, this is a piston filled pen, so you, you, you actually operate the piston here to draw up ink. As you can see, it has an ink window, uh, through which you can see ink, not right now, because there's no ink in there. Um, but that's, that's how it will work. Both pens are very nice. Both pens are classics. Um, I think we should take these apart, and then we'll have a look at how they write. And that's all let's do it. So I hope this was uh, this was useful. I hope the next part is going to be useful. And that's all let's do it. So I'll see you later. Bye bye. All right, my lovelies. Uh, what we've got here is a Parker 51. Here we got a Lamy 2000. We'll start with the 2000. People always like to uh, see how you take a pen apart. At least that's what they tell me. So I assume that's the case. So I've I, I've already shown you this for another shootout. Well, let's do a very fast rundown. I never really show you how to take apart a cap because I don't think that is so interesting. I mean, if it's something is damaged, then you may want to do that. But for now, I think we should just focus on the pen. Well, it's a very simple thing. You see, there's a sort of, at least I'm not sure whether you can see that, but there's a very fine line right there. Well, so that's sort of where you hold it, and then you un can unscrew the barrel and the section. Here's the section. And now, when you're very careful. You can sort of push the nib and feed out. You saw what I did? I didn't really... I mean, clearly you don't want to start banging on your nib, um, but if you just very carefully just grab it, you can just push it out like that. Uh, something I'm not sure whether I've shown you that earlier, but um, there's a little rubber O-ring there, which tends to get lost when you flush the pen, for example. And you have things disassembled, so be careful you don't actually throw that away. You can slide the nib off if you want, and no, this is not a nib that will also go in a safari. It's a different type of nib. Here we have the barrel, the barrel and the piston turning knob. Well, if you carefully just keep untwisting that, 
Make some alarming noises, but don't be scared. It'll just come off. You see here you've got the piston guiding unit, and here you've got the actual piston turning knob. And now what you can do, I always like to take a crochet needle. I don't actually know how to crochet, but we had a couple of these lying in the house. Um, these have a fairly blunt end, so don't use the tip and use the blunt end. And then very gently, you can just push out the piston. Um, clearly you don't want to start banging that, but you know it should work. Now if you give this a quick sharp pull, you find another sort of piston guiding thing. As you can see it's tapered, so you have to pull that out. That will give some resistance, so don't yank on this. Just give it a quick sharp tug and it should just come out. You have the actual piston, of course, you can put some silicon grease right there if you want to. Uh, this one feels a little dry, so I may just do that. I'm just wiping it off here, off screen. There we go. I'll do that when I reassemble it. Um, should you wonder which end goes where, well, it's very simple for the piston guiding unit. It only goes in this way, and it goes in that way, not all the way, so it doesn't go in entirely. So then you know that you're doing something wrong, and you should just turn it around, and then it should work just fine. All right? So those are all the parts of the 2000. Oh yeah, and a very important bit. See that metal ring? That pops off. So be careful. Uh, this is a, a, a typical bit that you lose. So make sure you put it in. You see these little holes there? This just slides in there. Just put it on, fiddle around a bit. It should fit in fairly easily. It shouldn't be difficult. All right. Um, let's uh, assemble that again. I'm just going to use... I don't want to get too much silicon grease from my fingers here, so what I'll be using is a little Q-tip, or a cotton tip, or whatever you like to call that. Put some silicon grease on there, and I take the piston, just apply it there. This, this works well, I never really get any hairs on there or anything, so just be careful. Get that bit out. There was a little hair there, of course, when you say that, it happens immediately. Uh, you can just slide that back in, you see it should be very easy. It just slides back in. You can use that piston guiding rod to take that in there. And then you just keep screwing. And there you go. And because this now has some grease on there, it's a super smooth motion. A pleasure to use. Okay, I wipe my fingers off just to make sure I don't get any silicon grease on there. Um, just slide the nib on there, put that little o-ring on there, no silicon grease goes near this. Yes indeed, that is why I put that silicon greased tip quite close to it, that was not very smart, but it worked all the same. There you go, pen is assembled, operates smoothly, in other words, boom, it's ready. Parker 51. Here things get very interesting. Disassembling this pen is, is not something that is done very easily and I would not actually recommend it unless you have a really bad pen that needs to be cleaned thoroughly, parts need to be replaced, etc. Um, many many gratitude goes to Steph from Grant Mia Pens. Uh, he's on YouTube as Penkino1. If I don't forget I'll, I'll link to his videos in the description of this video and if I do forget point it out to me. Um, he has a three-part video on how to uh, disassemble, clean and assemble uh, a 51 and that was very very useful. So, alright, you take the cap off, you can take the jewel off, Steph shows you how. As I said I don't want to go into caps here. Um, you unscrew the barrel and you get this aerometric converter thing going on there. Uh, there's a sack in there which you can replace if it's necessary, this one is fine. Um, and I'm, nevertheless I'm going to show you how to take off this. This is a sack protector which has a little bar which you depress or actually press to, to draw up ink. Um, you can pull that off. Now that's easier said than done. So usually what I do is I use two of these. It's just that stuff you put on the carpets. Very useful because it gives you a good grip. I just grab the section I grab the sack protector. Of course you want to be careful, you don't actually bang the nib into anything, but usually, there we go, it just slides off. So you have that sack protector. Of course you want to be careful, you don't actually bend this. If this loses its roundness, it will be harder to put on there. That speaks for itself, I would say. Um, and that's the first part. Alright. Now, usually, what Parker used to do, 
uh, was shellac, uh, which is a sort of adhesive. Uh, shellac, the, uh, this part, the cap, or the nose cone, or the, uh, whatever you like to call that, um, the hood is another term I've, I've heard used, um, they shellac that in place. So you cannot just unscrew it. It does in fact unscrew, but it's, it's hard to do. So what you want to do is either take if you're very courageous, something like a little burner that will give you some open flame to heat this. Some people find that a little scary. Um, you can use a hair dryer, you can use a heat gun, and since this is not hard rubber, you can also just put this in very hot water. That should uh, dislodge the shellac a bit. And then, well, dislodge, I mean, I'm not sure whether dislodge is the right word, but make it melt or make it soft, make it pliable, whatever. Then you can take it off. Now, I've done that, I've just done it with some hot water. That was all it took. Um, but sometimes it may be a bit harder. Uh, and now I think, yes, so what I can do now, what you cannot do, you see what's happening there, um, I can just unscrew the hood. And if you do that for the first time on your 51, that's probably not going to work, so you have to heat it up first. So here you have that hood, here you have the collector, the nib, the feed. There's a little ring there, and there's a rubber O-ring sort of washer um, which is right there um, okay now you just you can gently pull this out now be careful if this is encrusted with ink and you start to pull on things you may break stuff so then you really have to soak it well but as you can see it's very clean here the person who had this pen before me really cleaned it well which is a very good thing now you should be able I'm just trying to pull this out here there we go. This just slides out, doesn't screw out, it's not threaded. Here you have the breather tube, which you can carefully pull out. Don't wriggle this around, as you can see it's, it's a, a pretty thin thing. Be careful with that. You have the nib and feed, you have the collector. You can sort of wriggle that out. There we go, that is the nib. Here we have the feed, and once one is out, the other should be easier to get out, because it's a fairly tight fit, and of course that's what you want. You want this to be a tight fit, you don't want your nib to fly out while you're writing. Alright, so you see this very interestingly shaped nib, this sort of round thing, which is very different from a lot of fountain pens, right, where you just have a nib that slides in there with the feeder. You've, you've seen me do that a couple of times, probably, uh, with other pens. And then you have that very round, interesting feed, a very thin little thing. Because it's thin, it will also snap in half, so be, be careful. Alright, shall we put this back together? Um, you can just grab the nib and feed, try to keep them aligned. Now what I found that that's an easy thing to do is you sort of grasp this close together and then sort of close that, that gap between the nib and feet, that way it's easier to slide in. Now on top of this thing, the collector, there's a wide channel. I'm not sure whether you can see that, but it's right there. Um, maybe I, I can grab a loop and, and show you. I'm not sure whether that's going to work out very well, but we'll see. Um, closer, closer, there we go. Alright, nice and overexposed. Uh, yeah, there's light very close by here, sorry. Um, where is it? Here we go. This is a wide channel. Yeah, it's, it's a sort of transparent see-through thing, so it's very hard to see. I should, of course, just show to you like that. Uh, you see there, on top, there's a very wide channel, and then on the bottom, there's a very narrow channel. The very wide channel goes up, so you want to align that with the breather tube, of the nib. Um, I grab a hold of those two things and I just grab it there, just pinch it for a second. Alignment seems to be good. And it just slides in as far as it'll go. Both the nib and the feed, there is a sort of notch like thing inside the collector. That the uh, th that the feed and the nib will actually slide in into, so that you can't push them in too far, which is a lovely feature. All right, then what you can do um, is take your 
breather tube stick that in there I think I have to yeah what's the other way around yeah that slides in easily now there we go alright now this has to go back into the section and um, there was a lovely trick from Steph uh, which I'll gladly steal but of course I'm giving him credit uh, what you do is you screw this thing all the way back in place. Don't over tighten it. The weird sound is caused by the rubber o ring. There we go. Okay, something like this. Now, what you want to do, I mean, you see that the, the, the uh, hood points straight, right? I mean, that's this is how far it will screw in. Now, what you do is you put your thumb on there so that you know your thumb aligns with the top of the hood. Alright? You unscrew this. Now you stick the nib and feet, and of course you have to be careful with that breather tube. You just stick it in there. Steady hand. Slow and steady. Wins the race. There we go. Slides in there. Now I start, I take the hood again. Nib aligns with my thumbnail. So that I know I start to screw this thing in. I can take one more turn, I think. Boom! The hood and the nib align perfectly. Nib sticks out just a little bit. And then people would recommend to shellac the hood in place. I have not done that here. I want to see whether I can draw up ink, whether it leaks. It's a bit of a personal experiment. And besides, I like to keep this in such a state that I can easily disassemble it again without heating stuff. I'm not sure whether it's going to work. We're going to see. Um, what I'm going to take up next is a little bit of talcum powder. This came from Anderson Pens. You can uh, buy it at some other stores. But the problem is you need pure talcum powder. So not talcum powder with other stuff in there. Disgusting stuff. It's just pure talcum powder. And I just coat the sack a bit with that. Um, Parker used ply glass for their 51 sacks to deal with ink that was a little, um, well, what's the adjective? Alkalic, alkaloid, or whatever that is. Uh, it was a bit nasty, let's put it that way. And they used the ply glass as opposed to the standard rubber sacks that were uh, used at the time, I think. Now, I am not entirely certain whether this is ply glass or rubber. It is somewhat see-through, but I thought that on the original 51s this was even more see-through. I'm not sure whether it was discoloured by ink. In any case, the talcum powder will absorb moisture, and that will keep a rubber sack in somewhat better shape. Now, I'm not sure whether it's necessary here, but there was some talcum on there when I, when I put this, uh, when I took off the, uh, the sack protector for the first time. So I just replenish the supply a bit can't do any damage. This slides on there. You saw there were threads, but my um, sack protector is not threaded, so I just take it out like this, I just by sliding it off. As I said, this stuff is really useful for that. If you want to go more aggressive, you can of course use section pliers, but you know, on plastic, I'm, I'm not really a, a huge fan of that. Alright, screw the barrel back in place, and your Parker 51 is taken apart and assembled again. And now, we got us some ink. How about that? If only I could open it. There we go. This is just Parker Quink, nothing fancy. First I ink up my 2000. And then I ink up my 51. It's an aerometric. So what you do is you just squeeze that bar. Wait, it's actually on there, by the way. It says, To fill, press ripped bar firmly four times, holding pen point down. Wipe point with soft tissue. I always like to do this a couple of times. Call me a fool. There we go. I'm grabbing my ink cloth, the infamous ink cloth that has been featured in quite a number of videos. Take the pen, get off the drops, 
and um, I'll see you on the other side. All right, welcome on the other side. So what we have us here is a lovely, juicy Lamy 2000 in a bleak broad. Um, the paper is Rhodia. And here we have a Parker 51. Now don't be shocked. But this is a fine uh, nib, so I mean, don't think that this thing doesn't write or anything. But this is a very saturated broad nib, and this is just not. So I would say this is a fine or a medium, but I, I, something in between, perhaps. Um, and that's that's all that's to it. So let's do a bit of writing. For a nib this fine, it is a joy to use. It is really smooth, no real feedback, and that is wonderful. Usually finer nibs tend to give you some feedback. Here I have a really fine Japanese nib. It doesn't write, I know that, but you hear that sound, and then you hear this sound. Same thing, but I mean it's the same, same motion, same pressure, but just a whole different feeling. All right, it's an oblique. Have to rotate this a bit to make it right properly. Heaven knows what made me get a get an oblique, but another very smooth one, very pleasant to use. Love using that pen. All right. Maybe a bit of wetness. Well, it's quink. It's quick drying ink. But that's a pretty wet pen. I'm assuming the 51 is going to show us some lesser wetness. It's just a bit drier overall, but it's a bit finer. It's a very quick drawing thing we've got going there, which is useful if you enjoy such things. You see the difference in pens? Same ink, completely different feel. Alright, well, when it comes to springiness, flex, this is all I can squeeze from the 51, which is not a whole lot, should you wonder. Um, Lamy 2000. whole different matter gives much more uh, spring to it but then again this is sort of semi hooded I guess as the nib sticks out quite a bit whereas the 51 is completely hooded so I mean there isn't a whole lot of space for the tines to open right and you know what I think that's pretty much all there's to it you have two very nice pens two classics two pens that have been around for a long time. The 51 is no longer produced. The 2000 is. Uh, the 51 is widely available. If you want one, eBay or pen shows, you'll, you'll, as we would say in Dutch, break your neck over these. There's so many of them that it's it's hard to miss them. Um, but it's lovely. All kinds of different colors and finishes and, well, yeah, finishes, colors, I should probably say. Uh, this one has a rolled gold cap. You also have them with, a, with, with I think, some, some aluminum caps or at least some type of, uh, I don't know, uh, alloy. Um, the 2000, you can also purchase an all-metal an all metal version, which is uh, very heavy. One of the heaviest pens I own. Um, so, which is nice if you, if you like that kind of thing. Um, as I said, timeless classics. I hope this comparison was useful. And um, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.